Hey y'all, welcome back. Hope you're having a good day. Today we are going to continue learning how to solve quadratic equations. And last time we learned that you can solve a quadratic equation by graphing it and identifying the x-intercepts. We sh I showed you how to uh, use the calculator to generate a table so that you could plot the graph out. And then once you have the graph plotted out, you can either identify the x-intercepts um, if they're integers, it'll just come up naturally in the table, but if they're not integers, then I showed you another little trick in the calculator, how you could uh, estimate what those x values would be. So today I'm going to show you another method, and I know it seems like we're going to go through a lot of methods in this unit, and we will, um, but this is a second method that we can use to solve quadratic equations. You can always fall back on the graphing method, um, you know, that works as well. Um, but this might be a little quicker, a little bit more efficient, if you're able to do it. So this method isn't going to work for every quadratic, uh, but it will work for a lot of them. And that is, we are going to solve by factoring and taking advantage of a property called the zero pro product property. We'll talk about all that. Um, but basically, as long as you know how to factor a quadratic, you should be able to find the solutions to uh, the related equation pretty easily. Now we've already gone over factoring, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over those steps, um, although I will show the steps as we go through a lot of the example problems. But uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Since we're going to use factoring as our method for solving quadratic equations today, let's briefly review how to factor. And so we've got three problems here that each are going to be a little different. And so all of the quadratic equations that you have that can be factored are going to fall into one of these three categories. So the first one is what I like to call the easy ones, um, and that is when you have your a value that equals 1, okay? And notice that our leading term here, the x squared, you don't really see a, uh, a coefficient on there, and whenever there's no number in front of your variable, the coefficients assume to be one. Okay. Um, then there's the the harder ones, and that's when a is not one. I'm going to actually skip over here to number three. Okay. Um, not, and when I say hard, they're just longer, and there's more steps to it. Um, and we'll go through how to do that. But this is when a is not one. Um, notice here it's two. Okay, so there's just a, a few extra little steps in our grouping process that we got to go through. And then finally, we've got the GCF one. So this is like, I don't know, medium, I guess. Um, you just have to know, uh, uh, well, I'll just call it GCF. You just have to uh, be able to recognize that there is a common factor in uh, all of your terms. So in this case, you have a common factor of an x. A lot of times this will happen when there is no constant here, like if there's, you don't, you don't typically see plus zero, but notice like on the first one there's a 12, the third one there's a three, here there's nothing. Um, in that case, you know, we can typically factor out an x. But you also want to be looking for opportunities to factor out a, uh, you know, part of the coefficients as well. Like on number three, we're looking at the coefficients of two, seven, and three. None of those, there's no common factors other than one of any of those numbers, so we can't really factor out a GCF to make the problem easier. So let's kind of go through each one of these. So when A is one, um, we're going to start by drawing a little X. Um, we're going to put the top number, I'm sorry, the uh, constant on top. We're going to put the uh, linear coefficient, or the B value on the bottom. And our goal here is to find two numbers uh, that multiply to give you 12, but add up to give you negative 7. So two numbers that multi so think about this for a second. How, could, how do I have two numbers multiply to give me a positive, but when you add them up, you get a negative? I'm just putting these little symbols here to remind you what we're looking for. So uh, the, what happens in this case is that you actually have two negative numbers, because a negative times a negative would be positive, and then you can add those up to get a negative 7. And so those two numbers here would be negative 3 and negative 4. Now, when A is 1, you're pretty much done here. These are going to be the two constants in each of the binomial factors. So I can write this now in factored form, uh, x minus 3. And times x minus 4. And so if I were to uh, multiply those together 
uh, using FOIL or the distributive property, uh, I would get back to the original statement, which is x squared minus 7x plus 12. So this is in factored form now. Um, and that's pretty much it. This, that's why this is the easy one, is as long as you could find those two numbers, then uh, you're done. Um, if you have a greatest common factor, in other words, you have a factor that uh, both, or all, I'm sorry, all of your terms are divisible by, you can divide that out. So in this case, we have a GCF, which is X. So we can rewrite this as F of X equals X times and then think about what we would have left over if we were to divide each of these terms by x. x squared divided by x is x, and 7x divided by x is 7. If we were to distribute the x, and I'll just show this real quick, uh, if we were to distribute this in, check this out, we would get x squared plus 7x, right? which is what we started with. So this is the factored form. Um, let me take that away just to kind of clean this up, uh, and, and that's it, okay? So if you've got the GCF, you just divide it out, and then you have your two factors. Let's look at the last one. This is the one that is going to require the grouping method. Uh, it, it takes a little bit more work, but, uh, but I think we can still handle it. So we're still going to use this big X um, to uh, help us work this out, but you got to remember what we're trying to do here when a is not one is we're trying to break up that middle term. Okay, so what goes on top is a times c, which in this case two times three is six, and then the b value goes on the bottom, just like how we did over here. So we're trying to look for two numbers that multiply to give me six and add up to give me seven, and that would be six and one. So those are gonna be the two coefficients of the two linear terms I'm going to have when I break down this middle term. So basically what's, what's, what's happening here is we're going to just bring down um, the first term. We're not going to change anything there. We're going to split up that middle term using those two kind of magic numbers that we just found, the six and the one. And then the final term just, you know, that stays where it is as well. So the first and the last term don't change on this first step. Uh, but the middle term is going to be broken down. Now, we're not going to be totally done here. Uh, unfortunately, there's still a few more steps that we got to do. But let me go ahead and write that out. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Slow down there. Now, I'm just going to write x. I'm not going to write 1x. Uh, typically, you do not write the 1 if it is uh, your coefficient. Okay, so we've broken down. Um, let's see if I can move this over. Make this a little easier to see. Oh, come on. Come on. There we go. All right, so there we go. There we go. Um, so the next thing to do is to group the first two terms and the last two terms. So we're going to basically put parentheses around the first two terms and the last two terms. Now, if you've got a minus on that second uh, linear term, if this is negative, then um, you're going to want to make sure that you factor out a negative number when you do the next step. Uh, okay, so we got that, and now we're going to factor out the leading coefficient. I'm sorry, we're going to factor out the GCF, sorry about that, the greatest common factor of each of these binomials. So the greatest common factor of the first one is going to be 2x. When I factor that out as a GCF like I did in the second problem, I'll be left with x plus 3. And then the second binomial does not have a GCF other than one, so all we can factor out is a one. So nothing changes on that one. We're almost done factoring here. The last step is to factor out the binomial, that x plus three, um, like it's a GCF. So we're gonna end up with uh, f of x equals uh, x plus three times, uh, I'm kind of blocking myself here. Let's see, two x plus one. And so now we've got it factored. So that's just a, a quick little re review of how to factor. Um, if you'd like to see more examples of that, just go back to uh, the videos um, from earlier in the unit and I go over a ton more examples, um, especially with this um, hard one where A is not one. Uh, these two will be a lot easier. Obviously, it's just like one little step. Um, but you gotta be a little bit more careful on these. 
Now, a function is in what we call a factored form when it's written as a product of factors, okay? So factored form is when you have something like y equals, uh, well, let me write it like an equation here, y equals, um, you know, x plus p or, you know, some number, and then x plus some other number, I'll call it q. Okay, so this is what factored form looks like. Uh, so this is factored form. And then standard form is when you have, uh, when, it, when the two factors have been multiplied together and it looks like this. Okay, so factored form is over here on the left. This is called factored form. And then non-factored form or standard form is over here on the right. So what we are going to try to do is we're going to put our equations in factored form and take advantage of something called the zero product property, which states that if you have two factors that multiply together, so if a, b equals zero, so if a times b equals zero, then either a is zero or b is zero. In other words, if you have two numbers that multiply to give you a zero, in other words, the product is zero, then it means one of the numbers have to be zero. So the whole point here is that if our equation is set equal to zero and it's in factored form, then either the first factor is equal to zero or the second factor is equal to zero. And what this allows us to do is find the two zeros which correspond to the x-intercepts uh, or the solutions to the equation by setting each factor equal to zero. And that's the big idea here. So as long as you can factor it, you just set each factor equal to zero, solve them independently, and you will get your two solutions. So let's, let me show you, uh, you know, sort of how that applies. Here's a bunch of examples here. Now all of these, as you can see, are already factored. So we don't have to do the factoring process that we did up here. It's already like set up and ready to go for you. So the basic idea here is that we are going to split up the factors. If 2x times x minus 4 equals 0, then according to this zero product property, one of these factors, or both of them, must equal 0. So either 2x equals 0 or x minus 4 equals 0. So uh, let's move that up a little bit. Sorry, sorry for the uh, delay here. Um, so yeah, e either the 2x has got to be 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. And from there we can solve. Okay, we can divide both sides by 2 and get x equals uh, 0. On the right-hand one, we can add 4 to both sides. and we get x equals 4. So we get our two solutions. Um, there are going to be two of them. Remember from our experiences solving these by graphing, it's possible to get one solution or two solutions or no solutions, but most often you're going to get two solutions. Now once you kind of get the hang of this, you can kind of jump straight to the answer on a lot of these, but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to take it a little slow here. So 5 says x minus 3 times x minus 9 equals 0. So either x minus 3 is 0 or x minus 9 is 0. So write those out. Either x minus 3 is 0 or x minus 9 is 0. So let's go ahead and, and solve uh, this one first. Um, if we've got x minus 3 equals 0, then what we want to do is add 3 to both sides. And we get x equals 3. If we add 9 to both sides on the second equation, then we get x equals 9. You might start to notice that if you're... 
factors have a leading coefficient of one, then the solutions are just going to be the opposite of whatever um, whatever you see in uh, whatever the constant is inside that bin binomial. So, uh, like if you, we look at the two factors here, x minus three, we get a, a, a solution that's positive three. If I have x minus nine, solution's positive nine. So once you kind of recognize that, it becomes real easy to find all the solutions. Now, I'm going to skip six for a second. I'll come back to that, but let's take a look at number seven and see if we can use that shortcut. So we've got three factors here. So this actually isn't even a quadratic, but we can still use the zero product property to solve it. Um, we just need to set each factor equal to zero. We're just going to end up with three solutions here, so not a big deal, but uh, just know that that's going to happen. Uh, but let's see if we can use that shortcut. So like look at number five and say, okay, if, I have, if x minus three is a factor, then three is a solution. If x minus nine is a factor, then positive nine is a solution. So if x plus one is a factor, then x, uh, then negative one should be a solution. Similarly, if x minus three is a factor, then x equals three is a solution. If x minus two is a factor, then two, positive two, is a solution. So we actually end up with three solutions here. Um, and you could you know, work them out like we did up here, uh, but once you kind of recognize that pattern, you can kind of jump straight to the solutions. Number six looks a little different, but it really isn't that different. What we want to do here is actually just rewrite this as x minus 1 times x minus 1. That is what something squared means. So just you multiply that by itself. So if it's x minus 1 squared, then it's just really x minus 1 times x minus 1. Now, you might notice here, okay, well, those factors are the same. If I solve each one of these, I'm going to get x equals 1 both times. Right over here, I get x equals 1. Um, not Z. Come on, Mr. Schuler, get it together, man. All right, <laughs> uh, we get X. We get basically we get X equals one in both cases, right? So in this problem, um, we only have one solution. So this would be a case where like the um, the the parabola is going to come down and the vertex is going to be just hitting that X axis once. Um, Actually, the graph is not going to look like this. It's going to be over here. Uh, yeah, one, positive one, not negative one. So I just want to give you like a little, um, just a little, uh, you know, visual for what's really going on here. Um, so th there's only going to be one solution. You don't have to write it twice. You know, it's enough to just say, okay, x equals one, and I'm done. So this is a, uh, an example of where you have one solution. Uh, number, f you know, these other ones have two solutions, so you'd have a parabola that comes down and, and touches the x-axis twice. Let's look at a few examples where you can factor out a greatest common factor. So number eight, um, you want to look at the two terms, and you notice there's no c term here, right? You're not adding a constant, so we know we can factor out at least an x, but we also want to make sure that we're factoring out as much as possible. And you look at the coefficients here, two and eight, and try to think of, is there any number I can divide both of those by, you know, other than one? And there is. They're both divisible by two. So uh, what I can do here is I can factor out a two x. And when I divide both terms by two x, I get x plus four. And that's because two x squared divided by two x is just x, and eight x divided by two x is four. So now that I've got it in factored form, I can set each factor equal to zero and solve them separately. Now these look a little different than the ones above, so I'm not. Gonna, I'm going to skip over that shortcut. I'm actually going to show, um, you know, the full work here. I get either two x equals zero, or I get x plus four equals zero. We know that's going. We know the zero that's going to happen on that one, um, but let's let's work it out anyway. For this one, we're going to divide both sides by two, and we'll get x equals zero, because zero divided by two is zero. And on this one, we will subtract four from both sides. And so we'll get x equals negative four. So we get our two solutions here, and that's it. Uh, we found both values that we can plug into the original equation. Like if I plug in zero here, 
and I, uh, to all the x's, I get a true statement, 0 equals 0. If I plug in negative 4 to both of these x's, I also get a true statement, 0 equals 0. Uh, it is not a bad idea to check that after you get your answers. Um, so just know that you can plug these in and double check and make sure that you got the right answer. Now number 9 is a little bit different because notice this one is the first one we've seen that isn't equal to 0. Now, to use the zero product property, your, your equation has to be equal to zero. Remember, all of this really hinges on this little property here that if you multiply two things that equal zero, uh, then it, one of those two things or both of them are going to be zero. So number nine doesn't equal zero, so we can't use the zero product property immediately, but what we can do is manipulate this a little bit by subtracting 15x from both sides and getting an equation that is equal to zero. So that would end up being 6x squared minus 15x equals zero. And now it's set up kind of like number eight, where we can find a greatest common factor. Um, in this case, the greatest common factor would be 3x. If we were to divide that equation by 3x, we'll get 2x minus 5. Now, the first one should be pretty easy to find. The second one, we're going to have two steps. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's going to take, you know, all the ones we've seen so far have just been one step after you do the factoring and you're done. Um, this one is a two-step equation. Not a hard one. Uh, we solved these, kind of, I, I think it might have been the very first unit of the year where we solved linear equations with two steps like this. Uh, so it's been a while, but I think we can handle it. This one, we're going to divide by three. Um, We've seen on a bunch of these, zero divided by anything zero. So we get x equals zero as one of our solutions. And then for this one, we want to start by adding five to both sides. Oh, it looks like we're going to get a fraction on this one. Yeah, because check this out. We're going to get 2x equals five. And then we got to divide both sides by two. So 5 divided by 2, if you want to put that as a decimal, you know, throw it in the calculator, that's fine. Uh, I'm a big fan of fractions, so I'm just going to write it as 5 halves. So um, we have our two solutions now. Let me kind of just group them together so I can box them. Uh, I always want to declare your answers here. We get 0 and 5 halves. Now this is about, well, it's exactly 2.5. So if you were to come up with a decimal, that'd be okay too. Uh, it's just that some fractions are a little trickier to write as decimals. So, okay, there we go. There's a couple of greatest common factor problems. Um, so we kind of use this second, uh, you know, this category of factoring. Um, let's, you know, we, we looked at some that were already factored. Now we're looking at DCF. Now we're gonna get into sort of the meat of the lesson, which is actually doing the factoring. Okay, so I mean we did factor these GCFs, but this is going to be more factoring trinomials. So we want to first, you know, check to see is it going to be an easy one or a hard one, and that all depends on that first term. Okay, it depends if the coefficient of that first number is either one or something else. If it's one, it's going to be an easy problem. If it's not something else, then it's going to take all those extra steps. So number seven, um, it, it is one. Well, good news, right? So uh, we're going to draw our x. A times c, which is one times two, goes on top. B goes on the bottom. And so we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give me two, but add up to three. And that would be two and one. So since this is an, uh, you know, falls in that e, quote, easy category, we can go ahead and factor it right away. We get x plus 2 and x plus 1. So those two values are coming from these two numbers that we found up here. Once you have it factored, um, we're kind of on easy street here, right? Because if x plus 2 is 0, then x equals negative 2. And if x plus 1 is 0, then we get x equals negative 1. So we got our two solutions, and that's, that's it. And that's what we're going to do on all these problems. We're just basically going to factor it, and then use the factors to find the different solutions. Number 8, we're going to draw our x. We're going to put a times c, 1 times 18 is 18 on top, and then negative 9 on the bottom. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give me 18 
but add up to negative 9. And that would be negative 3 and negative 6. I know it seems like I'm coming up with those numbers pretty fast, and that's just, you know, because of practice. Um, the more, more of these you do, the faster you will, you'll get at, at finding those two numbers. Um, so don't, don't, don't get discouraged if it, if it feels like you're taking a long time to come up with those. All right, so both of these factors are pretty straightforward. So, you know, what do you think the, the zeros are going to be here, or the solutions? If x minus 3 equals 0, then we get x equals 3. And if x minus 6 is 0, then we get x equals 6. And so now we've got our two solutions. Now just to kind of give you a, a, you know, a visual here, remember that these solutions correspond to the x-intercepts. So if you want to do a quick little sketch, we know we've got an x-intercept here at 3, you know, over here at 6. And so the, the parabola is going to do something like this. Okay, so once you know what these solutions are, um, you can start to, you know, visualize kind of what's going on with the graph. I don't really need that, but I just want to give you a quick visual here. Okay, let's look at a couple other ones. Now, uh, just to kind of uh, hit this point again, um, in order to use this technique, we have to have the equation equal to zero so that we can take advantage of the zero product property. So in both of these cases, we got to do a little something here. So like on this first one, or number nine, we got to subtract 14 from both sides, which will give me x squared plus 5x and then minus 14 equals zero. And now it's set up to, to do the factoring. Similarly, on number 10, we want to move all this stuff to the left-hand side. So that would mean we're going to add 11x and we're going to subtract 26 from both sides. And now we've got the equation uh, in that form. So I just wanted to you know, really emphasize that your equation must be equal to zero to make this work. On number nine, I'm going to draw this little x. We're trying to find two numbers whose product is negative 14 and whose sum is 5. So if the product is negative, that means one number is positive and one number is negative. So the positive number here is going to be 7. The negative number is going to be negative 2. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14. 7 plus negative 2 is 5. So our factors are going to be x plus 7 times x minus 2. And therefore, my solutions are going to be x equals negative 7 and x equals positive 2. Number 10 works the same way. Uh, hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here where we're kind of doing the same thing for all these problems. Uh, negative 26 is going to go on top. 11 is going to go on the bottom. Again, we need two numbers whose product is a negative, specifically negative 26. So, uh, One's going to be positive, one's going to be negative, just kind of like what happened over here. And that's going to be 13 and 2, or 13 and negative 2, rather. Multiply these together, give you negative 26. Add them together to give you 11. Now we've got our factors, x plus 13 and x minus 2. From the factors, we can use the zero product property, like we've been doing in all these. And, and find the solutions. So if x plus 13 is equal to 0, then x is equal to negative 13. And if x minus 2 is equal to 0, then x equals 2. So we get two solutions on this one again. So notice most of these are going to have two solutions. Uh, it is possible to have no solution. It's also possible that the equation is just not factorable. We haven't seen any of those yet, but um, I think the point here, and we'll see some of those later, I don't know about today, but it is possible to have a quadratic that is not factorable. In other words, you can't come up with any two numbers like this. Uh, uh, and when that happens, we have to use a different technique. The factoring technique simply just won't work. Um, but for a, lot, for a lot, and I would even venture to say most, um, most of the problems you're going to see are going to be factorable. But we will eventually see some that are not. Okay, so let's look at number 11 and 12. 
Uh, now we're starting to, uh, you know, dip our toe into some of the harder problems because, hey, take a look here. We got a is equal to one is not equal to one, so that's going to fall into this hard category, at least at first, until you realize. Wait, hold on. There's a GCF here, right? There's a GCF which is five. Okay, if your equation is equal to zero, you can actually divide both sides by that number, if all this is going to divide evenly. And when I do that, I get x squared minus x minus 6 equals 0, which is a much easier equation to factor. We just really tricked this problem into, you know, into, from being a hard one to being an easy one. So you, know, you want to take a look at that, see if that's possible. It might not be possible, in which case you have to do the whole grouping method. But here, we can kind of get around it. So I'm going to put negative 6 on top, negative 1 on the bottom. Our two numbers here are going to be negative 3 and positive 2. So my factors will be x minus 3 times x plus 2, which means that my solutions will be x plus 3. I'm sorry, x equals positive 3 and <coughs> x equals negative 2. Number 12 is, looks like it's going to be set up a little similar, but uh, check this out, it's not equal to 0. So we need to take care of that. Let's, let's do that right up front. 2x squared minus 5x, and then we need to subtract 18 from both sides. So can we divide every, something out? No, unfortunately, 2 and 5 are both primes, so there's no common factor here, which means this is going to fall into that harder category um, where we have to do the full, the full process of factoring by grouping. So negative 18 times 2 is going to be negative 36. And then we put negative 5 on the bottom. So we're looking for two values whose product is negative 36 and whose sum is negative 5. The two numbers that will allow you to do that uh, would be negative 9 and positive 4. Right? If I multiply those together, I get negative 36. Add them together, I get negative 9. So the way I'm going to split up that middle term is I'm going to rewrite this as minus 9x plus 4x, which does equal negative 5x. Right? All we're really doing here is just breaking down that middle term and then we want to group our first two terms and our last two terms. So in fact, I'm just going to throw that in there right here. We got it up and running. Okay, and we want to factor out the GCF out of each one of these groups. So in the first group, my GCF is X. And in the second group, my GCF it looks like it's 2. Yep, looks like it's 2. And that gave me 2X minus 9. Recall that when you're doing this, this is kind of your, 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 a place where you want to stop to make sure you're doing it right. Notice here that we have the exact same thing in both sets of parentheses. If those are different, then you need to go back and maybe try something else um, because something went wrong or it's just not factorable. Uh, but if you're doing it right, these two things should be the same and that will be one of your factors. The other factor will be the two things you factored out, the two GCS, so x plus 2. And so now that we've got it in factored form, we can now find our, uh, our two solutions. So let me split this up. Okay, so for this first one, we get 2x minus 9 equals 0. Uh, let's, let, let's, let's work that one out, because that's going to be a multi-step one. Um, if x plus 2 is a factor, we know right away that that's just going to be negative 2. So on this one, we need to add 9 to both sides, which would give me 2x equals 9. And then we need to divide both sides by 2, which is going to give us a fraction, not a big deal. It, 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 you can write it as a decimal, so if you know, you'd prefer that, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to bring this down just so it's easier to box here. But uh, there you go. We got our two solutions. We got 4.5, or 9 halves, and negative 2. 
All right, just a few more examples here and then we'll be done here. We got, looks like just two more problems. So number 13, um, ooh, this one's a little trickier. This is a little different. Okay, but not, uh, no GCF here. So this is gonna end up being one of these harder problems because the A value is not one. There's no GCF to divide out, so we're kind of stuck doing that. Um, the interesting thing here about this one though is that the B value is zero. So something weird is gonna happen here. Or maybe not weird, but just maybe a little, little different. So negative four times nine uh, is actually negative 36, which we knew from above. And then it's gotta add up to zero because there's no linear term there. So that, that actually makes it pretty easy because it's gotta be two numbers that multiply to give you negative 36 and add up to zero. The only way for that to happen is if your positive and negative numbers are basically the same, like, you know, positive two and negative two, or in this case, negative six, and positive six. And so we're gonna rewrite that middle term like that. So we got nine x squared, and then that middle term, which is not even written up here, but is really like a plus zero x. We're gonna break down as minus six x plus six x, and then minus four, of course. We're gonna group the first two terms and the last two terms, and then factor out the GCF out of each group which in the first group is 3x, and in the second group is 2. So my two factors are gonna be, they're gonna look very similar here. We got 3x minus 2 times 3x plus 2. I'm gonna scroll down just a tad, give me a little bit more room here. There we go. Um, so yeah, now we need to solve each one of these out. So we're gonna solve out the 3x minus two and the 3x plus two. We're gonna set each one equal to zero and then solve them independently. So for the first equation, we need to add two to both sides. We get 3x equals two and then divide both sides by three. So we do get a fraction here, x equals two thirds. Um, on this one over here, we need to subtract two from both sides. So we get three x equals negative two. And so when we divide by three again, we get uh, just the opposite solution here. So when this happens, um, where you've got that zero term in the middle, uh, quite often you're gonna see that you're gonna get like plus or minus a certain solution. And that means that the parabola is symmetrical about the y-axis. Um, in other words, like if I were to sketch that out, it would look like this, where the vertex is on the is y-intercept, and then you'd have your zeros at plus or minus two-thirds. All right, so for this last uh, problem, we're gonna work it exactly like we did this one. Um, but the only thing we have to do up front is make it equal to zero, so we need to subtract 50 from both sides. Uh, but this one's gonna be a little easier because we do have something we can divide out from both sides, and that is a two, right? Both of these terms have a factor of two, so we can divide uh, two out and m morph this from a hard problem to an easy problem because we, we get that leading coefficient to be one. So it turns out to be a little easier, I guess is where I'm going at. Uh, so we wanna find two numbers whose product is negative 25 and whose sum is zero, and that'd be plus or minus five. Since this leading coefficient is one, we can jump straight to the factors. And it's really, it's, it's really good to know that you can do that because it just saves a lot of time. You, that way you don't have to do the full, I mean, the full grouping will work. So don't get me wrong. If you're comfortable with the grouping, you can do that on every problem. But look how much easier it is to just kind of skip straight to the factors here if you know that's going to happen. Now on both of these, these are, these are both sort of simple factors. Uh, so we should be able to come up with the solutions pretty, pretty quickly. Um, we get x equals positive five and x equals negative five. Again, when that b term is zero, you should get the plus or minus with the, basically you get opposite solutions. Um, and we see that happen here as well. So that's pretty much it for today, all right? Um, so 
Uh, just to kind of recap here, what we went over is we went over how to solve a quadratic equation using factoring, which is a technique that uh, we learned earlier in the unit. Uh, so now we know two different methods for solving quadratic equations. Uh, the first method we learned last time, which is to solve this by graphing, and now we know how to solve it by factoring. And what you'll see kind of down the line is, depending on how the equation is set up, it might be easier to do the graphing, or it might be easier to do the factoring. And a lot of times that's a judgment call on your part, but it's good to have both of those tools in your toolbox so that if you are more comfortable with one over the other, um, you'll know when, when to use that. So. Uh, that's it for today. Next time we'll look at even another method for solving quadratics. Um, we're not done yet. Uh, so y'all have a great day and I'll see you next time.